Hello there. My name is Thomas, and I hope you can hear me clearly. I hope my voice sounds okay, because I'm pretty sick with a cold right now. <laughs> but I thought I'd try and record this and, and get it out on schedule, because that's the kind of guy I am. <laughs> Not feeling too bad now. I've been down the last last week. I have a cold which uh, I caught on a fantastic trip. I'm now in the United States, and my girlfriend's family showed me the best uh, the United States has to offer, and that included Disney World. Uh, so I flew to Florida last week and had a fantastic three days going around the parks. And the last day was supposed to be just a, a day at home relaxing and ended up having tornado warnings and all sorts, but uh, didn't affect me too much. I was in bed with a cold. And then um, well, I had to catch the flight back. And I wasn't feeling too bad on the flight. Um, but with a cold, you know, the air pressure changes. Normally the ears pop, and because I had a cold, the ears weren't quite popping, so bit painful. I wasn't feeling so sorry for myself. There's a girl uh, in in front of me, uh, in front of me on the next aisle over, who was really sick. I think she was a teenage girl, first time flying apparently, um, and she was actually sick into a sick bag. Oof, felt sorry for her. Then she was queasy again, so she went back to the toilet behind us all um, to go and throw up, but it was locked. So she ran back to her mom and didn't make it, and she ended up throwing all over the guy behind me and me. <laughs> so I was sick all over me, <laughs> which didn't freak me out. I'm all right. Um, as, a, as a naval reservist, I've been on a little ship in the North Sea going up and down. I've had many people th throw up all over me. <laughs> but, uh, oh, poor girl. So I felt a bit sorry for myself, but she was she was embarrassed to bits. Uh, guy behind me yelling and shouting, oh, you should be sick, it's gross. <laughs> Myself just chuckling through it really. <laughs> Poor girl. But anyway, I've been I've been sick rotten <laughs> with the cold and maybe being sick on wasn't the best. But anyway, that's been my week. <laughs> Not the worst week. <laughs> An alright week. And uh but if my voice sounds a bit strange, and that's the reason why. A few days ago I asked on my Instagram, which is Fleming Never Dies, uh what topic would you like on my next podcast? And the results are in. 69% said, what is Albion? And only 31% were like, Wars for Peace, which surprised me. Wars for Peace is an old piece of research I did. Quite academic, quite in-depth, um, and it's kind of, it's a piece I have on standby. It's, it's in the back cupboard, <laughs> so it may come up again. Uh, but what is Albion? I guess it makes sense, since the title of the podcast is British Culture, Albion Never Dies, that people are kind of curious, what is Albion? But I was wondering if it would be too UK specific. Uh, but when I was looking at who was voting, um, I was imagining it would be all British people wanted Albion and other people would want something a bit broader, but no, it makes sense if you're listening to a British culture podcast, you're interested in British things, uh, but people from all kinds of uh, backgrounds, different countries and so on, uh, were voting for Albion and and indeed for the other one, but 69% asked, what is Albion? Naturally, I did a quick bit of Googling just to check that my ideas were correct. There's lots and lots of different ideas about where the word originally came from. It's certainly an ancient word. You might find it in uh, Celtic and Gaelic. In it's It does come up in Latin. Um... There are a few different languages. I think Welsh shit it comes up in. But it's one of those things where it's so far back in history, it's extremely difficult to say. I came across a piece recently by uh, an archaeologist who was saying the thing that upsets her the most about archaeology movies is where someone comes across some ancient scrolls, some ancient texts, and immediately fluently tells you exactly what the ancients were talking about and saying that's the most unrealistic thing. Um, I used to translate from Turkish to English, and I have to say, someone might say to you, hey, what does... Bayoldum mean? And I'm like, well, it could mean I loved it, but it could also mean I'm passing out. You, <laughs> you need a bit of a context. You know, even for a living, breathing language where you can just ask somebody, hey, what does this mean in your language? Um, we can look it up pretty easily. Even then, context means a lot. You know, what does Tajuk mean? Well, it could mean child or it could mean guys. Hey, fellas. Um, so in ancient languages, you're missing all that context. You know, there's, there's not many ancient Romans or ancient Gauls or ancient Britons you can ask. Um, but it does come up as a very ancient word for, well, those islands over there, right? So in Julius Caesar's time, you know, he absorbed all of Gaul, um, except for one small village if you read Asterix and Obelix. But anyway, he conquered all of Gaul, 
um, and then looked across to those islands over there, the white cliffs and all that. So whatever was over there was often referred to as Albion or Britain. It seems Britain is the one that, that we've all kind of stayed with. Albion seems to be somewhere around there as an alternative word uh, for what we all are. So again, it's the name of the podcast, Albion Never Dies. Um, and I could have put, say, England Never Dies. A lot of people might find that uh, easier to understand. But I didn't want to go there. England is a very specific uh, political con- political construct. Um, right? It has it has borders. It's on the main island, Great Britain. But there is a border between what is England and what is Wales. There's a border between what is England and what is Scotland. It, it has its own government. It has its own authority. Um, and again, it has a very specific history. And I didn't want to call my podcast England Never Dies because I didn't want to cut out, for example, Scottish culture. Um, a lot of people might find this podcast through my James Bond account. Um, it seemed very strange not to include Scotland in a discussion when you know he's played by a very prominent Scot who wrote a book called Being a Scot. Um, and his Scottish ancestry was put in by Anne Fleming because he liked Sean Connery. Um, so I really wanted to include Scotland. Uh, and of course, Welsh history I find fascinating. One of my favourite kings to read about is Edward I. Um, he's sometimes known as the Hammer of the Scots, but in fact his real achievement, aside from giving peace for England uh, against the barons, was the conquest of Wales. Um, I find that a fascinating piece of history uh, of how he completely absorbed Wales as part of our political construct so that by the time of his grandson um, and the beginning of the Hundred Years' War, we have the Welsh as key players in our army. Um, so again, I wanted to, to include Wales, um, and of course there's Ireland. Um, so I could say, Britain never dies, but most people when they think about Britain, think of Great Britain, again that's the biggest island in the British Isles, and they're not really thinking about the Isle of Ireland. Um, a lot of Irish people wouldn't say they're British, they'd say I'm Irish. Um, so, you know, you can say technically, geographically, what's well, all the British Isles, but really when people are saying where they're from, Irish people say they're from Ireland. <laughs> and, you know, it, again, it's a specific, modern, kind of social, political word. So I didn't want to have those associations with my podcast, really. I wanted a bit more poetic license, a bit more freedom. So that's really the negative definition of Albion, it's, it's what it isn't. But whilst I'm on the point of uh, what is England, what is Scotland, it has been contested throughout history. So, for example, there's a small small town called Berwick upon Tweed, um, and this is kind of really on the boundary between England and Scotland, fought over by the English and the Scots for hundreds of years, and in one in one century, I believe, it crossed over 14 times between Scotland and England. So when, in the mid-19th century, um, 1854, we declared war on Russia, the beginning of the Crimean War, we declared war on behalf of the United Kingdom of England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, but then named all the other bits. Um, So, you know, we have the Isle of Man, we have the Orkneys, we have the Shetlands. Um, So that long list was given. And I visited Berwick-upon-Tweed and they talked about this, and I was told when I was there that when the peace treaty was signed, they listed all the different bits but forgot the town. So theoretically, all the other bits, Scotland is at peace with Russia, England is at peace with Russia, all the other bits of the UK are at peace with Russia, except Berwick upon Tweed. And allegedly this carried on until about 1914 when somebody noticed, and then it became a fun fact. And then in the 60s with the Cuban Missile Crisis, people start to get very sensitive to the idea of, hang on, there's a place in the UK which technically is still at war with Russia and there's nuclear weapons going around, maybe we should do something. So uh, in 1966, a special treaty was signed between the mayor of berwick upon tweed and a Russian diplomat, uh, the mayor reputedly saying, you can tell the Russian people they can now sleep peacefully in their beds. <laughs> so again, this idea of what is the UK, what is Great Britain, it can seem confusing to people who are not from these islands, but to be fair, it can be confusing for people living in them as well. I wonder if you stopped the average Brit in in the street in Britain and said, hey, what's the difference between Great Britain and the UK? I think they'd struggle. Um, 
But just to let you know, Great Britain is the biggest island in the UK, and the United Kingdom is the political entity that unites England, Scotland, and so on. And if you disagree with that, do message me on Fleming Never Dies, and we can talk about it. <laughs> Again, I, I include Scotland here a few times because it, I once took a ship all around the coast of Scotland and had the pleasure of going in and out of all the different islands, uh, including the Orkneys, and it was a magical experience, I have to say. So, Albion, it, we don't know where the word comes from, except that it's very, very, very ancient. It's a word that doesn't mean England, doesn't mean Scotland, doesn't mean the UK, doesn't mean these political entities. It is something that's rarely used just in poetry. Uh, so the Victorian Romantic poets used to talk about Fair Albion and so on. It's often used in King Arthur's legends. Um, King Arthur is a myth. People try and place it into history. Um, so there's a recent live-action Disney film, recent, um, which had him as like an ex-Roman soldier, and they put it in the Dark Ages because that gives them a bit of freedom. There's not too much written. Um, but there's enough written that if he was that big, we'd probably have heard of him. We'd have coins and so on. Uh, some people try and have him really as a as an Anglo-Saxon king. Um, and some really try and set it like outside our timeline in an alternative universe. Um, so a lot of them, like I think the once and future king, really, really is um, based, uh, once Arthur is an adult, is really based on Edward III. And he's a very, very inspirational figure. What's really interesting is that at the time of Edward III, there were already Arthurian legends going around, and he founded the most noble order of the Garter, inspired by the Arthurian legends. So he gets inspired by the legends, but he also inspires legends himself. Um, Henry VIII, of course, had a, a big round table specially commissioned, really, to draw upon this kind of mythological construct. So again, the idea of Albion is very, very Arthurian. And Arthur himself is, of course, the once and future king, so maybe Arthur... Maybe Albion is what the country was and what the country could be. It's aspirational. And like all aspirations, it's kind of elusive. So Albion, I'd really say, is like the stars in that we can't touch them, but they can help us navigate uh, and find a better version of ourselves. So there we go. A is for Albion <laughs> in the alphabet of Britishness. And I'm going to draw to an end there. As I said, I've had a dreadful cold <laughs> all week, and I'm going to save my voice. I hope you enjoyed it. By popular demand, what is Albion? It's an aspiration, and it's a dream.